Dear participants, first of all, I would like to say uh, good morning to you and I wish you a very beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience. We have some technical issues, but now uh, we have dealt with it with Anu. Actually, I'm a bit uh, surprised as well because this is very nice coincidence for me. Uh, four years ago, I had the opportunity to make a presentation in the same session with Anu in Istanbul during the International Film Festival. And now I'm uh, moderating her speech. So this is a very nice coincidence for me as well. Um, Anu Soyas Veganesan, uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly, is okay. from the <laughs> Zurich University. Today, she is gonna start with the presentation titled Family as a Cradle of Contagious Human Rights Violations. Um, so Anu, the stage is yours. Um, I don't know, at the moment we are at 9.42, so. Yeah. Thank you very much um, for coming for the introduction and also I'm glad to share this platform with you again after the film festival. Um, I prefer the presentation, just going to share that one with you. So I hope you can all see their um, slides. It's perfect. We can okay. see it. Yeah. Okay. So a very good morning, um, everyone. And it's my pleasure to be part of this um, Bosphorus Istanbul International Summer School this year and also um, spending this Sunday morning with you talking about the family as the cradle of contagious human rights violation. So not only COVID-19 can harm human beings, also harmful traditional um, practices can do so as well. And during the pandemic, the UNFPA, um, to, yes. Um, UNFPA, that's the United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health Agency, they started a campaign with the name Against My Will, and I just send you the um, link of this campaign for all of you who are interested. Um, Just trying to find. So just trying to find their chat function here. Um, yes. So I hope you can see their um, the link of this campaign in the in the chat. Um, forum. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so if you have the possibilities to open and go through this, um, you can obviously do this at this moment. And um, it is written in this campaign when you open this link as well that every day, many girls are subjected to practices that harm them physically or psychologically. And this too happens and that's also very important with the full knowledge um, and consent of their families, um, friends and communities. So as a next step, I'm interested to know what you think, um, what are harmful traditional practices before we go deep um, into analyze this from an international um, human rights point of view. So for that, I, um, prepared a, um, um, a questionnaire for you. I hope all of you have the possibility to access this website, www.menti.com. Um, so once... Uh, Once you are there, um, you can just um, click the code that you see on the slide, 
if someone has any issues with that, you can just write in the um, chat if, if it's not happening, vmnt.com. And then you just write the code 73889821. Now, can you see the answers that you have written down? Yeah, it's like a cloth, yeah. Because yes, it's... the word in cloud, yes. So thank you for this contribution. And um, a lot of you have written also um, discrimination, marriages, uh, genital mutilation, trafficking, um, domestic violence, FGM, murder, cleansing, um, patriarchal, harmful, so interesting. Thank you for these um, um, keywords and you already assume like forced marriages or um, virgin region school culture. So culture is an interesting term that you wrote down. We will look closer to some of these aspects. Um, so it is important also to understand when does this, the problem of harmful traditional practice um, was first addressed by the United Nations and that was in the 1950s, as you can see this in the slide. Um, it was in a resolution of the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations from 1952. And it is written here that this resolution calls all the member states, um, they were called up to abolish all customs which violate the physical integrity of women and which thereby violate the dignity. So again, a term dignity that we will also look closer into it and the worth of the human person. However, at that period, so in the 1950s, there, were, there was little action regarding the elimination of harmful customs um, and the issue was put aside. I think, and I'm trying to give a possible explanation for the reluctance of the international community could be the consequences of the World War II, and also with this context, the white supremacy. And it was also the period of decolonization. And also there was this controversial debate around the origin of human rights seen as, um, um, a representation of Judeo-Christian Eurocentric concept with individual rights that all led to a zeitgeist, a time period of cultural relativism and towards a strong commitment to cultural self-determination. As you can see here on the slide, um, the Article 1 of the both UN Covenants, ICCPR and ICSCR, they states or they starts with the sentence, all people have the right of self-determination and also the freely determine their cultural development. So that was a very signal symbol towards a strong commitment of cultural self-determination as well. But at that time, um, 1950s, um, there was an exception um, to this known interference or cultural relativism position regarding the traditional marriage practice. So the General Assembly of the United Nations, they adopted a resolution in 1954 with the aim to take all appropriate measures to abolishing um, customs, ancient laws, and practices by ensuring complete freedom of choice of a spouse. So talking about forced marriage, few of you mentioned forced marriage as a harmful traditional practice, and the abolishing the practice of bride price, which is also still um, a common practice in many parts of this world, and also guaranteeing the right of widows to the custody of their children and their freedom as to remarriage and also completely eliminating child marriages and the betrothal of young girls before um, the age of puberty. 
So this resolution of the UN General Assembly um, led to the legally binding convention just two years later in 1956. You might be familiar with this supplementary convention on the abolition of slavery, the slave trade and the institution and practices similar to slavery. And as you can see here in article one, for example, um, any institution where a woman without her right to resist or to refuse is being promised or given in a marriage on payment. So the bride price is being talking here, um, is seen as one form of or practice similar to slavery, for example. Also in article two of this supplementary convention, um, they, uh, it obliges the states to set a suitable minimum age of marriage um, to actually to abolish child marriages and to implement the guarantee of voluntary and self-determined marriage. So again, um, go um, against forced marriages through its institutionalization under um, civil law. So uh, the issue of harmful traditional practices, they came again in the 1970s. They were put front and center of the international agenda when especially the NGOs, so civil society, they started to raise the topic anew. And also the important the impetus came from the um, women's rights movements and the concept of harmful traditional and cultural practices was linked to the rights of women and girls. And the 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, shortly known also as CEDO, um, that stipulates in Article 2, for example, that state parties should take action against customs practices which constitute discrimination against women, so discrimination based on gender. And then in 1995, so I'm just giving you a historical view how this concept of harmful traditional practices was evolving international law, um, in 1995, the most important document to date, according to the literature, on the concept of harmful traditional and cultural practices um, that was published in 1995, and that's the fact sheet um, number 23, called Harmful Traditional Practices Affecting the Health of Women. Here we have again um, women and children, and this was published by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So this fact sheet is the first attempt to provide a general definition of the concept of harmful traditional practices. So according to this fact sheet, traditional and cultural practices reflect the values and beliefs of communities that have shaped and accompanied them for generations. Right? So it's not just for one or two generations, but for through many generations it was there. Um, and every social grouping, so every community in this world has its own specific traditional cultural practices and beliefs. And some of which are, which might be beneficial to all members. Um, and while there are others practices, they are harmful to a specific group. Um, for example, as women or children, and they are so called harmful traditional practices. So the discussion is um, or turns on the question, how do we deal with these harmful traditional practices? Um, again, harmful traditional practices are understood to be those practices which violate the human rights of certain groups of people in a society and discriminate against them on the basis of their gender, age, and um, other things, and also have their origins in social norms and cultural beliefs. These practices usually involve violent act um, with physical and or psychological consequences. They also have a negative impact on their dignity, human dignity, physical, psychosocial, 
and moral integrity and development, their health, education, economic and social status within the communities. And it is also said that most of these practices occur in patriarchal communities. And as I already mentioned, mainly women and girls, um, women and girls are um, victims of these practices. So there are plenty of international human rights um, instruments, convention, declaration, de resolution, who touch on upon this topic. But today I want to um, have your attention on the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the um, Child. And this was initiated in 1990. For me, this charter has a um, role model in international law because um, it clearly states in the Article 21 and the title of this article is Protection Against Harmful Social and Cultural Practices. Um, so they because they are affecting, as it is written in the section one, welfare, dignity, and the growth, normal growth of the child, the life of the child. And also, if you can see in the section two, they give an example of harmful social and cultural practices, child marriage, and the betrothal of girls and boys. They just don't talk about girls, also boys are included here. Um, and they urges, uh, and the charter urges the states, the member states, to set a minimum age of marriage to be 18 years. So this African charter gives a clear age, says it should be 18 years to get um, married. Also to um, gain a greater understanding of the concept of um, harmful traditional and cultural practices, it is also important to consider the reports um, by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on violence against women and uh, its causes and consequences. So this special body within the U uh, UN was created in 1994 and the first um, person who was um, appointed as the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women, um, her name is Radhika Kumaraswamy. She is a um, Sri Lankan lawyer and human rights um, advocate, and she was, as you can see, appointed from 1994 to 2003. And later on, um, this mandate was subsequently assigned to the Turkish sociologist Yakin Ettürk. You might her, uh, know her, and she was from 2003 to 2009 the special uh, rapporteur on violence against women. Um, so I want to focus on the reports um, written by Radhika Kumaraswamy because she dedicated in her annual reports a detailed discussion of the three broad categories of violence against women in the family um, and then violence against women in the community as a second category. And then the third, violence against women perpetrated by the state, like laws which were discriminatory, for example. And then she also focused um, violence in specific context as well. So in her introduction for the report published in 1994, um, the UN Special Rapporteur Kumaraswamy, she sets out the framework for the discussion of the problem harmful traditional practices. And she mentions as causes of these violence against women especially, one of them is the unequal power relations between men and women. And then in addition, the second cause, she addresses sexuality. So violence against women is used as an instrument to control female sexuality. And then there she takes an in-depth look at cultural ideologies as a cause of violence against women. And she considers, for example, the cultural construct of masculinity to be at the center of this um, of these ideologies also under the title um, cultural practices in the family that are violent towards women um, the UN special rapporteur Kumaraswamy um, she reports in detail on practices detrimental to women and girls who are assigned certain roles within a family context. 
And there she urged states not to invoke any custom, tradition, or um, religious um, um, consideration to avoid their obligation, the state obligation, to eradicate violence against women and the girl child in the family. So instead, she suggested st states should develop penal, civil, and administrative sanctions in domestic legislation to punish incidents of violence in the family and also provide redress to victimized women, even if the violence is um, associated with a common cultural practice. So this leads me to their um, well-known debate also on cultural defense and cultural offense. We um, face that also in the penal um, law debate, right? So I have given you here um, explanation or definition um, from um, Van Berg, for example. You have the literature um, information on the slides. So a cultural offense is meant that an act by a member of a, of a community, um, which is considered an offense by the legal system of the dominant culture um, in a country, but that same act is within the cultural group of that perpetrator um, accepted as a normal behavior and somehow approved or, or promoted in that given situation that he uh, or she committed this um, offense. And then cultural defense that maintains again um, person's subjective view and sense of um, socialized in a minority or foreign culture who regularly um, conduct themselves in accordance with their own cultural norms that should not be held fully accountable, so legally speaking, criminal law's um, point of view for conduct that violates official law, for example, the penal code, um, if that conduct conforms to the prescriptions of their own culture. So the view is um, that the individual person who acted, um, so they act with the intention of complying with certain social, cultural, and traditional norms, and um, this is interesting debate. For example, in many Western countries, cultural defense is still being used sometimes, but not always, obviously, um, to take into the um, circumstances or the culture where the person grew up. Um, and um, to give you also the Turkish example, um, the law, for example, responded uh, in the past Turkish penal court. I'm sure you are all familiar with that. So the old Turkish penal code, for example, explicitly used um, values, so cultural va values as a mitigating factor in determining punishment. And also many often there were cases of so-called um, killings in the name of owner. Um, of wives or daughters, for example, they were admitted as incitement associated with mitigation of the sentence. So the old, obviously that has changed after the penal reform and with the new um, penal code which came into force 2005. And also the, the old Turkish penal code already introduced in punishment um, um, an increasement in punishment, uh, which is a very good example as well, for a killing for blood revenge in, I think, in 1953 already, right? So the aim of this increase in punishment was to push back the practice of blood revenge, which is one, one form of harmful traditional practices. And with this legal handling, the Turkish authorities at that time signaled as early as 1950s that blood revenge as an act that is culturally justified by the persons involved or established as the cultural offense is not tolerated by the state or the um, Turkish law. Um, and then again, to come back to the penal court reform 2005, 
they also dealt with the remaining cultural defense. Um, and um, I think Adam Sotzer played a huge role in this um, reform period. And he also mentioned in, in one article that the reform was with regard to the gender equality. And one of the most important reforms was the abolition of this mitigation for crimes committed in the name of tradition or honor. And um, this adaption of the law was primarily intended to curb homicide offenses in the name of honor or tradition. As you can see, there are a lot of samples where cultural offense and cultural defense, where the law reflects or um, try to push back these cultural offenses as well. And also there are examples where this cultural defense is used by the um, legal system as well. So to come back to our topic today, the family, um, when we ask the question uh, or look closer to it, who are the perpetrators of these crimes? Maybe mostly, very often. Um, we heard the terms family, so it's very often family members, right? Um, so I would like to ask you again to do a short activity, still um, we have a little bit, um, let's say, um, not only listening, that you're also getting active in this um, session. You could go again to the menti.com and use the code 7388982, um, siblings, father, family members, safety, um, partnership, oppression, interesting, um, bond, warmness, positive aspects, respect, tolerance, um, adaptive commitment, union, nuclear, so nuclear family, um, marriage. So marriage and family is very bounded um, here. Um, Non-legal and kin, um, on moral. So that's also interesting to see moral values and um, family. So it's family is a curious um, institution one could say. So I ask you, what is the family for you? And there were so many different um, um, answers and we could agree that the answers are obviously very emotional, like someone said also like warmness, bond and um, loyalty, harmony, um, and also personal for each and every one of you, right? So, um, we think of prob probably like you have thought also of your loved ones. So that's why brother, siblings, father, or some people um, also would say my best friends or my family. Um, maybe also if you are sharing your apartment with someone or flat, then you say your my flat community is also my family. So very different uh, for, for each and um, one of you. And um, thank you also here for um, for your contribution. Um, so um, in a legal broader concept, right, when we um, ask this or um, uh, defining the concept of family, um, it means immediate relatives such as parents, um, as some of you mentioned also, and children, people related by blood, uh, marriage or adoption and the extended family with the wider kinship. So the understanding of, of a family within a legal context would maybe contradict um, the personal definition of the family um, of each one of you. So there are different approaches um, to define a family in a legal context. It, there is formalistic, function-based, um, like security, raising the children, financial support are, for example, keywords here, and also idealized um, married couple with children, for example, and self-definitory approaches are existing here. So in some countries, the family relations are based on a nuclear family, some a few of you mentioned nuclear, um, while other traditions, such as, for example, in Asia and also in Africa, recognizes forms like polygamous, extended and joined families system. Um, since I'm giving you today also the Swiss um, perspective, in Switzerland, the legal notion of family is not restricted 
through the traditional nuclear family, like married men and women and their children. For example, in the Article 13 of the Swiss federal constitution, um, so the interpretation and the legal practice, they have a broader understanding of family, depending on who plays an essential role for a family life. So the criteria vary considerably, blood relationship, mutual duty of care, financial dependence, um, even living together, partnership um, in a house or apartment, and also there are further elements um, and affective bonds also considered into interpretation of this um, article. On a worldwide scale, we would have to accept as a basic minimal common denominator um, that is somewhat um, formalistic and a rather conservative interpretation of the family, marriage or having children would certainly be part of this um, definition. So despite many social changes, marriage and married life still remain a central entity of the family interpretation, both in the realm of social and also in legal um, ideas. I want to show you this graphic. Um, this is um, from this year, Euro Statistic 2020. They collected data until 2018, and it's about the life birth outside the marriage. So I have selected few countries um, for today's purpose. As you can see um, in the graphic, that Turkey has the lowest rate with 3% of birth outside of marriage. And then you have Switzerland, 25, let's say 25%. Um, Germany is higher than Switzerland. And um, as you can see that Iceland, in contrast with almost 70%, is the highest birth outside of marriage. So this leads me to the interpretation also that this is an expression of strong norms of family existing um, in these different countries. So, for example, Turkish, con Turkish constitution um, does not offer any definition of the family, but the Article 41 of the Turkish constitution relates family is the foundation of the Turkish society and based on the equality of um, between the spouses and this was inserted in 2001 um, so the constitution also the article 41 also relates to the um, protection of the family um, through the state as well and the first form formulation of article 41 um, which was accepted in 1961 constitution um, and the turkish civil court which adapted the swiss civil court reflected also at that time the concept of family which was also a swiss um a swiss conservative or bourgeois family with the husband as the head of the family and the wife was responsible for the household and raising the children that was the family concept um at that time also under the swiss civil court um so i think it's also interesting to Um, to think about or to um, um, I, I prepared a also here um, maybe for you brainstorm again um, what do you think or how is family protected by law because we heard now the Turkish um, constitution we heard the Swiss constitution how is family protected or if the family is protected um, through the international human rights and do you know um, any um, resolution declaration or conventions that protect the families so just try to write down at least five of these um, again here go to the menti.com so your answers will be collected and I will obviously also analyze them um, later on if you are interested I will also send you um, the results Okay, thank you very much. Let's see. Um, CDO, CRC, um, Convention of Rights of the Child. Um, 
Istanbul Convention, uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights, um, migrant workers and members of their families, a convention on that, um, and then also European um, Convention on Human Rights. Um, but thank you very much for these um, brainstorming and the answers. Um, you realized there are plenty of international instruments, human rights instruments, which protect the family. And it's in interesting to ask, where does this concept or the uh, legal idea comes from to protect the family, right? I think um, the concept of human rights and family as a term, both have been the object um, of controversial debates globally. Okay, just you, yeah, more or less we see um, similar answers coming again. Um, it's going back to our slides. So we'll um, talk about, touch up on few um, human rights instruments. Um, just the nuclear family is entitled to special protection under international law. So there, there are stresses on the nuclear family, but equally also under Swiss federal legislation, um, as I showed you before. And here we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of the United Nations from um, of 1948. Um, it's as the name already says, it's not a binding instrument, it's a declaration, but today it is recognized as customary international law. And there the Article 16 contains three elements. First, the right to marry and found a family. Again, the link between founding a family and then right to marry. Um, we will discuss also critically about this link um, later on. And second, the requirement of free and full consent of the intending spouses, so it's not, it will not be forced um, marriage. And third, the section three of the article 16 defines the family as the natural and fundamental group unit of the society, same like the 41 of the Turkish constitution. Um, so this provision of Article 16 of the UDHR has been further amplified and clarified in subsequent human rights treaties. So here, for example, Article 23, um, Section 1 of the International Covenant um, on Civil and Political Rights of 1966 defines the family um, as well as the natural and fundamental group unit of society. This is somehow a term um, repeated in different um, treaties and conventions, um, and that the family is entitled to protection by society and the state. So the protection of family includes, um, according to Article 23 of the ICCPR, for instance, also the right to the right of men and women of marriageable age, again against child marriage. Um, to marry and found a family and um, provision shall be also made for necessary protection of um, any children in the case of dissolution, dissolution, divorce or annulation of this marriage or, or, or the family. So the Swiss Center of Expertise in Human Rights is of the view that international and constitutional laws um, in different countries take into account the fact that family relationships are of the greatest importance for the physical, psychological and social well-being of people and as the primary safety net in the event of any crisis and illness which also relieves the state. That's kind of the understanding based in these um, different in international um, instruments. So the, the state therefore um, is not only obliged to respect family life, but must also take legislative and other appropriate measures to protect family life from disturbances and dangers and promote its prosperity. Um, so initially, basic human rights protected the right to enter into a marriage willingly, 
and unhindered by any state um, intervention or to outright renounce the right to marry. So even the right to have children and to raise them was protected. And this was a response in order to prevent state interventions um, such as sterilization or birth control, especially in cases when these interventions were not appropriate, not found on a legal basis and not in the interest of public. So the right to family was closely associated also at this time when these um, international human rights instruments came into force with the right to marriage. And the right to marry without any restrictions based on race, nationality or um, religion um, was also drafted after the consequences of World War II, in particular the Nazi law, which prohibited interracial marriage. So um, I'm sure you are familiar with the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination of 1965, and that states in Article 5 um, that um, it should be guaranteed the right of everyone without distinction as to race, color, or national or ethnic origin, so equality before the law. And they specify civil rights, in particular, the right to marriage and choice of spouse. So why was this put in an international convention? And since 1948, um, when the UDHR came into force, modern human rights have also been established and expanded in response to the horrors um, of national socialism and to overcome colonialism and apartheid. So bans and constraints around marriage and intimate relationships are often found at the core of systems that trampled on human rights. For example, be that in the law, um, Nuremberg law for the protection of German blood and German honor. Um, that's of 1935. Um, so during the Nazi era, uh, this law prohibited sexual and marital relations between so-called Aryan and Jewish persons. Or they are also in the case of the settler society in Southern Africa, the South African apartheid system that further cemented racial separation in 1948 and which did not allow for marriages between whites and blacks um, with the prohibition of mixed marriages act um, but there are also um, the so-called jim crow laws uh, in the southern united nations um, united states the u.s states up to the 1960s which also prohibited marriages between white and african-american people so it was not as one might think that um, there was this US civil rights movement, right? That abolished um, this um, interracial prohibition of marriages. Um, so the US civil rights movement happened through 19, or there was also laws of 1964. Um, no, it was a um, decision by a federal Supreme Court in the case Loving versus Virginia, um, 1967. So then they enabled nationwide freedom of marriage between white and black Americans and led to the beginning of the end of the so-called Jim Crow laws as well. Here in the slides, you see Mrs. Mildred Loving and Mr. Richard Loving on the photos. Um, so 1958, they were sentenced for one year prison for violating the Virginia, uh, Virginia's Racial Integrity Act uh, of 1924, um, because that act has seen interracial marriages as a crime. So the loving, um, the family loving, they appealed their uh, the convictions. They went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court obviously gave them right. And this decision ended all race-based legal restriction on marriage in the U.S. And the Supreme Court held that such a law violates the equal um, protection. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. If, uh, if it's the time for the break, 
um, just let me know, the moderator, I'm asking you, or shall I continue further? It's up to you. Okay, then I just continue, uh, maybe 15 minutes, and then we will have a break. Mm -hmm. okay. Sure, as you wish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, the language of understanding family, which was used in 1948, so when the UDHR came into force, was definitely characteristic of these times. So Article 16, um, as you have seen here, directly associates the right to marry with the right to found a family. Um, and also the moral value is reflected, um, for example, in Art Article 14 of the Swiss Constitution, which um, regarding the basic right to marry and to have a family has a similar um, concept like Article 16. But there are critics towards this reproducing and adopting the prevailing morality from 1948 until up to date with this continuation of marriage with the right to found a family. So this, for example, includes voices from the reproductive health sciences. They say that many of the family planning services are only available for married women or couples. And the sexual and reproductive health of adolescents are at risk, especially within the context where sexual activities among young people are socially not accepted. And the ones who are sexually active, they cannot afford family planning protection to prevent, uh, so that's a specific concern from the um, re reproductive health science, for example, to prevent from the sexually transmitted diseases. But I think the core understanding here is also that sexuality is um, very much linked and connected with the marriage concept uh, and then family. So sexuality outside of the marriage is socially prohibited in some countries, not only socially, also by law. For example, um, in Pakistan or in Afghanistan, there is a law called Zina. Um, so that's a criminal act if you have sexuality outside of the marriage. Um, but the, in the evolving understanding and also to eradicate harmful traditional practices, it is very important to separate these two things, sexuality and marriage. So I give you an example again from the Swiss um, um, understanding here. So in the Swiss majority society, it is informed that sexuality for minors is okay, but marriage not. Um, it is legally not forbidden that children below the age of 16 years um, or the age of consent, um, to, to use the term, they can have sex. Apart from the free consent to sexual act is a maximum of three years age difference that should protect against pedophilia. However, um, since 2013, also foreigners living in Switzerland they can only marry under the Swiss law because before 2013, there was possible to marry under um, your own country's law in Switzerland, but that was, that's not possible anymore. The marriage, marriageable age is 18 for everyone. There's no any excuses, it's 18. And this is precisely inversing moral norms of um, certain groups um, where they say no sexuality before marriage, but the law actually allows you to have sexual relationships, but it doesn't allow you to marry. And there are other countries where they say, um, or by law, they prohibit sexual relationship before the marriage. So this is a kind of inversing moral norms. And this can also kind of maintain rigid norms and may encourage also um, many people who are living, for example, um, in a transnational intercultural context that they might marry off their children, especially girls at early age. So this can also um, bring to the harmful traditional practices. And to give you um, numbers, the Center of Competence Against Forced Marriages in Switzerland, um, it is part of the Swiss government they have been observing raising numbers of child marriages. And that's very much linked to the 
understanding of female sexuality. Um, and then again, the knowledge about being a virgin to enter a marriage, which is part, which is ma many often seen as traditional or cultural or religious understanding in different communities. So in Switzerland, um, in particular since 2016, um, as I already mentioned, the marriage age is 18 without any exceptions. So here there are increasing number of child marriages. Um, you can ask, how is it possible if the law just allow 18 well um it happens religious marriages although a religious marriage cannot happen before the civil marriage the so-called primacy of the civil marriage the similar also in turkish um legal system but since 2015 it's also possible in turkey that religious authority can um enter marriages which has civil um civil rights kind of um, functions, right? So there was a um, small change reform in that um, marriage um, law in, in Turkey since 2015. So coming back to the Swiss, so there are minors who are married religious wise here before the civil, um, um, before the civil authorities. And also what happens is the parents bring their children to abroad where it's possible to marry before the age of 18. So for example, in Turkey, the marriage age is 17, but there are also exceptions at the age of 16 with court approval and so on. And also in Germany, you can marry uh, before the age of 18 or in Spain as well. So there are countries where it's possible. And um, so the marriage happens abroad and the parents bring them um, to recognize in Switzerland when they are living here, obviously. Um, there is a legal lacuna, but here again, the Swiss government um, has seen this problem and there is a legal reform is um, under construction or they are discussing also to change the law um, um, here as well. And the other one is betrothal, because there is no legal um, specific age for the betrothal. Do you say you need to have the capacity to understand, but um, it's, there's not a, like a marriageable age for betrothal. Um, so it's possible to get, to go through the betrothal before the age of 18. And that's happening a lot um, as well, how minors are bound to this um, relationship um, of, of marriage. So it is very important just to um, sum up uh, my thought here that the counter reactions should be also considered and adequate steps against child marriage as one form of harmful traditional practices is um, highly um, needed as well. And another criticism which I want to also highlight here regarding the human rights ideologies from um, 1948 onwards and also the concept of family um, have been also recently voiced by those who argue that there should be a redefinition of a family to accommodate for example sexual orientation of individuals and also family relationships not um, outside of this legal uh, marriage and there are these voices also as critics um, surrounding this concept and also think of the recent technology development regarding in vitro fertilization for couples where such an access is the only way to have children I'm sure the drafters of UDHR um, in 1948 didn't think um, of this technological progress. So it is very important conceptually when we talk about human rights, um, developments in marriage, so progressive developments in marriage, divorce and family law since the 1960s can also be understood as resulting from an increase in claim making, like claim making by disadvantaged groups. So um, women, for example, or children or disabled persons. So we have a convention on the rights of persons with disabilities, right? So these demands and claim making um, or on their behalf um, or brings to an increase or develop of the human rights as well. And central to this uh, is the demand of so-called, you can see that on the slates, the so-called intimate citizenship rights, um, which is extended or used or introduced to extend their Thomas Marshall's 
three dimensions of modern citizenship and entitlement that this um, British sociologist Thomas Marshall had conceptualized also in 1949. So when we follow this concept of Thomas Marshall, achieving, for example, property rights, fair trials and other civil rights, that was very important and pivotal for the development of the society. Um, so he wrote about the English society being a British sociologist until the 18th century. And then the 19th century saw the rise of general political rights, um, such as voting, well, at that time only men. Um, and then this period was followed mainly in, in the 20th century by the demand for social citizenship, um, like guarantee for material subsistence, right, in all life situations or social protection through the state from hardship. And now in the 21st um, century, the claim is made um, for intimate citizenship, the right to choose your own partner, sexual orientation, and so on, as a logical extension of legal and human rights. And it's also interesting, we have to understand the UDHR. Um, if you're interested to read this document also, um, there's a report by the Global Citizenship Commission. They say that we have to understand UDHR as a living document in a changing world. And that is, um, I think, uh, very important as well. So I would say maybe we do a break here, 15 minutes, and continue yeah. after the break. Yeah, I'm, thank you very much for this intense lecture, and I'm sure that you are tired as well because you have been given it for one hour, uh, and it was very intense. Thank you very much. We are in front of the schedule for 10 minutes, but that's good, so we can uh, use more minutes for the questions and answers but maybe so let's make a 15 minutes uh, break then uh, we will start at 11 5 maybe yeah okay then see you in 15 minutes thank you okay thank you see you then um so welcome back everyone hope you had a short break uh, without thinking too much about human rights and human rights violation but let's move on in the next um an hour to also elaborate more on this and then we will at the end i'll come to a one specific form of a harmful traditional practice forced marriage and obviously the situation in switzerland um, and in particularly i will also analyze at the end of my talk um, how forced marriages have been in switzerland during the covid 19 um, lately but let's move on further with um, family and international law. Um, in case you are interested in literature on this topic, I can send you, send you a reference list. Um, if you could maybe uh, let know their um, organizations about this. If you are interested in bibliography, or you can also email me and then I can send you a bibliography about family and international human rights um, law. Okay, just uh, so we ended here um, understanding human rights in a living um, as a living document and uh, in a changing world, and would um, sum up this. Um, family in international law with three um, specific references, um, or legal scholars um, who were also writing a lot about human rights and as a foundation, for example, the family. So according to um, Salvatore Gunasegar, a legal scholar, um, by including the family within the framework of human rights, one can ensure both the right to privacy from arbitrary interventions and also strike a balance between legitimate interventions and the right to privacy and family life. So in addition, there is a balancing act between individual rights and duties within the family according to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, Gunasegara states consequently that 
for example, the preamble of the UDHR clarifies that individual rights are promoted and respected as the foundation for freedom, justice, and peace in the human family, reinforcing the connection with the family and the community. So the core concept that individual rights and freedoms can be limited by law for the purpose of accommodating the rights and personal liberties of other members of the community and the general welfare of the communities is also basic to the UDHR. And according to Berta Hernandez Triol, another legal scholar, family separation, family support and protection of children were of great concern to many states because of the experiences during the world wars. Um, so issues such as dislocation and separation of the families, families, which also resulted in the question of paying child support uh, for the person who is obliged living in a different country than, for example, the child was living. And also with the creation of international labor organization, they were attempt to protect children from exploitation and child labor. Um, during the World War II, Germany's Nazi regime made use the institution of, fam of the family as a tool to effectively enforce also the state's rule. And the UDHR um, envisioned with its focus on the family as a separate entity to create an effective counterweight also to the power of states eager to control the life of its citizens. And if you want to read more about this thought, you can also, um, uh, it's written on the slide, Bria Kaman, Ing Ingar and Newman Karen, for better, for worse, uh, they analyze the article 16 of the UDHR in their um, article. So um, to continue, therefore, several declarations regarding the right of the child were adapted on the international level. It is also remarkable to note that the reflection children are not object uh, to protect by law, rather they are subjects and the measures should be in the best interest of the child. You're all um, familiar with the term, if you are with the human rights, international human rights, the best interest of the child is always coming again and again, also in different domestic legislation. This term came first in the Declaration for the Protection of the Ch Children in 1959, which then was acknowledged by the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. So it had always be measures protection of children in the best interest of them. And the international community therefore recognized the special and precarious status of the children family Therefore, measures with the view to protect them were taken. And um, human rights instrument with purpose of protecting families also aimed um, at protecting children. This is the reason why the family was recognized as the natural and fundamental group unit of society and entitled to protection by society and the state. And again, if you want to um, go deep further on this thought, you can read the Hernandez Trio Alberta asking the family question. Um, it is an article in the Family Law Quarterly. It's very interesting that um, um, also to read further. Um, so the protection of the family unit in several international conventions had as its objective to prevent entities, entities like state, for example, from engaging in arbitrary infringement um, on the rights of the families. And Hernandez Triol concludes also therefore that these international conventions and declaration were conceived of not just with the view to protect the family, but also to ensure the well-being of the children. Um, well, we heard a lot about family and the legal idea behind protection of this institution. Um, but we also have to think of that family is not per se to viewed in a positive light, um, especially when we are talking in the context of harmful traditional practices. 
So the policies and laws on family has a significant influence on women and children. So for example, the concept um, of the man as the head of the family, so the breadwinner um, understanding and the woman as responsible for the household, that was extant family model in the Swiss civil court until 1988. So laws such as these were a reflection of the traditional values which were existing at that time um, in, in Swiss society. And there are also many penal codes, um, defenses such as provocation in what are called owner killings. I already mentioned the Turkish example um, in the beginning of my talk, and they are repertory marriage between a rapist and the victim in order to defend the so-called family owner and also the decriminalization of marital rape and domestic violence, including wife battery and physical abuse, are a reflection of the law on family relations and the concept of marital or parental power over children and women. And it's important um, here, family in the law in this context, that human rights should be the foundation for um, reform, for example, in family, um, in family law, also other aspects in different um, legal areas concerning the institution of family. So when we are talking about human rights, the concept of human dignity, we heard a lot, a lot of the times also read in different um, human rights instruments, dignity, that comes always in forefront. So dignity as the fundament on which the human rights rest. Um, so here again, I think it's your turn now. Um, that will be the last um, short activity today. Um, just go to menti.com again and use the code 476979 and try to answer the question, what is dignity and what is owner? Are they same or different? Uh, what is that according to your opinion? Let's see, depends on culture. Just interesting to know whether dignity or honor was mentioned here, self-respect. Dignity is an, is an attitude while honor is a culture. Interesting. Um, dignity equals to respect. Honor represent good performance, a certain good result. Dignity is free from other people's perceptions, honor based on other people's ideas and subjective determinations. Dignity, quality of your human being. Interesting, so quality in the sense of whether you're good or bad in the sense also. Not an excuse. I mean, it referred here to honor, I assume. Words we never question. Um, Immunity, um, dignity is our value, owner is source of value. Kant, okay, the philosopher Kant is being cited here. They have the same roots, so dignity and owner has the same root, but in modern times, dignity became something relating to human being. On the other hand, owner is related with the name of an individual person. That's interesting, so owner and individual person, but we've been hearing a lot about family owner living freely without harming others and respecting the public interest. These are very interesting answers. Thank you very much. Um, so just try to sum up a few of the answers that you gave. Also, we will touch upon a few questions which came um, in these keywords also. I think it's interesting to discuss about them as well. So human dignity, as I already mentioned, is the fundament on which human rights are rest, right? It's not any natural, it's not any religious understanding or cultural, it's the human dignity, that's the fundament to human rights. And that's also laid down in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. So for example, forcing and lack of free will to enter a wedding um, would be a severe consequence which matter to us because they uh, endanger 
the equal human dignity, which is again the dignity bedrock principle for the foundation of the fundamental rights. Um, so we tried to reply or answer the question, what is dignity? I now focus on dignity and come later on honor. So in Judea Christian um, tradition, humans are the image of God. Um, in German also Ebenbild for some of them who understand uh, German here. And their dignity derives from this idea. This dignity is however, threatened from the onset. So I here refer to the biblical fall of man, the term fall of man. The original sin, so it's always with connect with the sin, that requires the human beings in the Judeo-Christian tradition to reoccur this dignity through their relationship with God. Um, there was one keyword all um, mentioned quality of the human being. Something similar here is also, um, if we refer to this relationship with God, what was the tradition of Judea Christian. Um, but even in the Western tradition, there are other roots than the religious one for this concept of dignity. For example, philosophical approaches emphasize the human reason as the fundament to human dignity. So for example, the Roman philosopher um, statesman and lawyer Cicero referred to the idea of dignitas humana. So Cicero being a child of his time, um, he was by far not an egalitarian and he excluded, for example, slaves and women from the concept of dignity because they were not perceived as political citizens able for reasoning and debating at his time. In the 18th century, Immanuel Kant, so I read Kant was written down in this uh, menti.com, Kant approached human dignity from the human capacity to act morally. So human beings are creatures able to make decisions based on rational thinking and therefore able to decide whether to live morally or not. But this also means that not only the good or moral ones possesses human dignity, also a bad person has dignity. So human dignity is inherent to all human beings, regardless of their qualities, let's put it in this way. And the endowment with it is an inalienable virtue of being human. And that's it. So debates surrounding um, culture and human rights are often accompanied also by a discussion of values, right? So the inherent meaning of value, that's a, that value per se comprises valuation, right? So you tend to overvaluate something, this culture is better, or you uh, tend to under-evaluate, or this culture is not so good, and devaluate. So there's this value comprises is happening. Therefore, to avoid this valuation or in, within different communities and cultural understanding, I pled for a human rights discussion oriented towards dignity because dignity, we all per se being a human, we have this inherent in us. And this is also again to mention laid down in article one of the UDHR. And I think by referring to dignity, we can also address human rights violations, um, which are sensitive so to certain communities, um, for example, connected to marriage practices, forced marriages, without any culturalizations. So I would um, now rest on a little bit on the contested notion of culture that is standing behind such debates when it comes to international human rights and pluricultural uh, context. Um, so when it comes to issues like marriage and the choice of one's spouse, often the term honor is at stake. And such as often also heard the family owner, which is 
mostly tied to the women's chastity and um, virginity. And in some cultures also, um, in some countries, um, the concept of honor-based violence is used in order to refer um, to crimes such as forced marriage. So culturalizations are coming to the fore here when we use, for example, honor-based violence, the, ter the term. So I want to argue honor and dignity is related to an individual that we also read in the um, answers that you um, given. Whereas from a juridical point of view, collectives such as families, kinship, they don't ha have honor no dignity in a in a juridical sense it's the family owner is uh, constructed by the society but it's not something protected by the by the law the individual family members yes they are protected by the owner but also in different legal um, systems but family what we hear very often family owner that's not a concept which is um, protected from a juridical point of view so that's why I also propose here, instead of speaking about honor based violence, to speak about um, king based gender violence. Um, why this definition, kin based gender violence? Because um, in this definition, you may see how around marriage issues and non individual concern in regard to marriage involves also an enlarged circle of possible perpetrators as well. So they are to a high extent transnational. Um, so family or extended family members are also possible sometimes perpetrators in different forms of harmful um, traditional practices. And it's important this transnational aspect for example, there are st statistics from the United Kingdom on the topic of forced marriages published um, this year, June 2020, for the past year, the statistic, and they say only 5% of the cases, they dealt more than 2,000 cases in 2019, had no overseas element. So that means 95% of the cases had overseas element, transnational um, aspect. And also this transnational aspect is very important, especially in this COVID-19 period where from Switzerland, for example, the Swiss Competence Center Against Forced Marriages observed as well, because give you an example, a girl is um, born here, living, um, grew up here, but her, her pa parents have, um, for example, um, take care of Turkish background. It could be during the holidays or whatever that they go back to. Either they go to another um, country, uh, for example, Germany, in case the, um, the, the other spouse or the future spouse is living in Germany or Denmark or Netherlands, or they might go to the Turkey as um, well to get this betrothal or the marriage union. Sometimes the girl is kept there she cannot return back. So we call that outplacement phenomena. And this is also very important um, because there is this transnational aspect is involved. And especially during the COVID-19, the problem was um, the persons who already were brought in a country X, Y, and they couldn't come back because of this um, travel restriction or based on this lockdown situation that few countries were um, introduced and it was difficult to bring them back. So just um, explanation on this um, transnational aspect also specifically during the COVID-19. Um, so coming back to this kin-based gender violence term, there are also gendered norms in the context of strongly patriarchal settings um, so being a woman, being a man, there are certain roles are expected. And when it comes to marriage, marriage is actually a culminating point to transfer and maintain tradition um, um, in, in different communities in many countries as well. And that's why 
I use the term here, kin-based gender violence. And when I say also about forced marriage or child marriage, it's one form of kin-based gender violence. So to also elaborate that the kin, the family, siblings, parents, uncles and aunts and grandparents could be possible perpetrators when it comes to force someone against their will to marry um, someone. But um, again, the question is also how we should deal with this contested notion of culture, because we heard tradition, culture, it comes again and again in the sense of fear where you have certain communities um, and its culturalization that stands behind it. So for me, I refer the UNESCO definition of culture, which is adopted in Mexico in 1982, and that encompasses in the notion of culture also. Um, so what we understand under culture, right? So here it's written in the slide, it says also that notion of culture is also a form of living, value system. It contains also traditions and religious beliefs. And also I want to highlight here, basic human rights is also part of the culture. So when it comes to culture, we observe two clear lines of argumentation. The first position can be called the culturalist perspective. Here you see a graphic, the X and Y. So if you try to explain, for example, harmful traditional practices, what is the role of culture? You could exchange that with tradition or with religion, with other words as well. Um, so in the X um, line, you have the cultural perspective, and then in the Y uh, line, you have the power of explanation. And you see this um, um, the so called culturalization. This argumentation line is a little bit essentialist and try to argue um, this harmful traditional practice is happening because of the culture, because the culture says it this way, or because of the tradition it sees this way. So, this is a little bit essentialist position, um, often combined when you see in debate human rights or politics surrounding human rights. Um, it's conservatism and populism. And that's very present in the public discourse, also particularly um, on forced marriage. And it can result or it results in stigmatizing certain communities and their cultural practices. Um, so in general, instrumentalizing cases such as forced marriages. Um, and then also to suprematist um, discourse, which values, for example, Western culture as superior. And then you have this vertical axis, um, as I mentioned, that shows the different cultural perspective. Then we see the nihilization of cultures or nihilist position. Um, I describe it like this, which actually denies culture or tradition or, um, and tries to explain, for example, when we stay in the phenomena of forced marriage, that forced marriage happens uniquely um, gender-based. So we're, we have to consider that gender relations are handed down as traditional concepts as well. And that cannot be separated from culture. So denying the independence of tradition, social behavior, um, preferences and specific cultural patterns, it's not helpful though. As you can see, both positions argumentation are not helpful. Um, if we want to understand a certain um, practices, traditional practices, why they are violating the human rights. Um, and I think it's also difficult and to find a concrete solution for the persons affected because culture is a process. And as a process, it also contains answers for the situation. And um, this is also shown in the practice of the NGO and counseling agency, for example, that intercultural knowledge, this is in particular for a country where there is more than one ethnicity is living together. Um, so this intercultural knowledge and skills are fundamental for due diligence in trying to solve um, harmful traditional practices. So for example, the Denmark government 
assumes that all marriages among cousins are forced marriage. I know whereas in Turkey, for example, or Pakistan, marrying cousin is part of cultural practice. And this understanding of cultural background is, or this knowledge is very important. I give you um, data here. This is from also in the context of kin-based marriages. This is from the um, Swiss Competence Center Against Forced Marriages. So within the Turkish communities, which they gave counseling, 34 of cases involved individuals um, um, where they were with kin-based marriages. And then you have also Sri Lankan culture where the cross-cousin marriages were decreasing, but then since 2010, um, the skin-based marriages are increasing again. So this is also interesting. We had in the beginning understanding of family and um, they were mentioned, one of your answers also blood. So the skin-based marriages is also coming from this probably understanding that you have to mar marry within the kinship or kin-based marriages and if you don't do kin-based marriages and what are other criteria that you marry within your own context of endogamous marriages right it might be the same religion it might be the same ethnic same kinship um same regions so there are different criteria surrounding marriage practices this intra-familial or intra-group um, marriages happening and just to give you the comparison for the Albanian speaking communities, which are living in Switzerland, um, on the other hand, kin based marriages were frowned upon. So they were not familiar with this idea that you marry your cousin or um, that you marry your cousin. So we can't just say kin based marriage is common in every culture and community. So this differentiation is very important when, especially from a human rights perspective, also if you work in this field, to have this differences and transitions to know about it. So how we should approach um, to culture or tradition, I would suggest for this middle path, the area mediocritas approach that is defined threesome by time, space, and the fact that culture is just a part of something. So concerning the temporal dimension, no culture is timeless and static, right? Culture as a dynamic process includes bifurcation, especially in the context of diasporas or countries where there are more than one ethnic is living together. Um, so the philosopher Peter Sloterdijk characterizes the modern society with the metaphor of form as multifocal model of society. And this approach could be transferred to the cultural debate where the culture experience through the context and interaction shows different manifestations um, and also the Turkish culture around, for example, uh, let's talk about the Berliner Kreuzberg is Turkish culture as well, but with the diverse pattern to the Turkish culture in Istanbul or the Turkish culture in Switzerland. So there is this dynamic perspective to the term of culture, which clearly is place, place bound with its own restrictions. And now to the partiality of culture. So the cultural element is just a part of what makes a community such as tradition, religion, and so on. So culture shares a mutual dependency and entanglement with tradition, which also leads to segregation and demarcation. So to sum up this um, thought on um, temporal, spatial and partial could be some instruments of thinking about culture and human rights um, violation and its circulation its, and its explanatory approach, um, culture is not encompassing. So just to focus now specifically on force marriage, I want to give you um, data. Um, beginning with the Great Britain, I already mentioned their statistic. As you can see on the slide, the five highest volume countries in 2019 were um, from South Asian subcontinent, Pakistan, followed by Bangladesh, India, and then Somalia and Iraq. And then again, see the um, 
official Swiss study on forced marriages from 2012 that identifies the migratory background from the Western Southeast, Europe, Turkey, and Sri Lanka for the majority of the victims. And also it is um, remarkable to note that 80% of the concerned persons of forced marriages in Switzerland um, are born or raised in Switzerland, but they have migratory background. And then also for those who are interested their Netherlands statistic, they have persons from Morocco and Turkey predominantly who are concerned by forced um, marriages. So move on to Istanbul Convention. Um, I know this is very highly debated also in Turkey about this convention, but Turkey was the first country to um, where this came into force as well, this Istanbul Convention. Um, on 1st of April 2018, the Council of Europe Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, so shortly Istanbul Convention, entered into force for Switzerland. And as you can see here, Article 37 um, clearly talks about forced marriage and demands for punitive um, measures that should be criminalized forced marriages. And a lot of countries um, did that, like uh, um, Belgium, Denmark, Germany, Switzerland, Great Britain, um, Luxembourg, Austria. So there are many more, Spain and so on. So they criminalized forced marriage. Um, give your, just to give you a short definition, what is a forced marriage? So it's a marriage concluded under physical or psychological pressure without the consent of the bride or the groom. And there are also other terms entangling this marriage practice, for example, forced engagement. Um, I mentioned already that, for example, Swiss law doesn't have a age for the betrothal, the same also in Turkish civil law. Um, so the individuals affected, especially also minors here, are promised for marriage and have no possibility to, to say no. Well, legally you can say there's no any um, pressure or any legal expectation that you have to enter this marriage, but still um, from a community or social understanding, there is this pressure that this person has to enter the marriage as well. And then also the another term marriage captivity, that's for example, married persons, they are forced to remain in marriage. So the divorce rate in Turkey, for example, it is increasing lately as well, if you compare to in the 1960s or 70s, according to Turkish statistics. Um, so there are also stigmas surrounding the divorce. Are people allowed to divorce or not? or they are forced to remain married as um, marriage captivity. And then this interesting discussion about arranged marriage as well. So um, arranged marriage is in many countries, communities, the social norm, where do you draw the line between forced and arranged marriage? So there's a, a huge debate on this term as well. So the technically, or let's say legally, um, arranged marriage is not prohibited because the law says the choice of the future spouse is determined by third parties, but the bride or groom have the possibility to say no or yes to the proposed marriage partner. This is very legal technical approach to arranged marriage, but if you take a legal, socio-legal um, approach or understand from the society um, what arranged marriage in the reality means, it might also have a lot of forcing elements in an arranged marriage. And then I put it here as an informal marriage. That's, for example, if a religious marriage is happening before the civil marriage, for example, in Switzerland, that's prohibited. Um, so that's so-called informal um, marriages. Um, I, um, in the slide, you can see the causes and independencies. I'm not going to elaborate further. What, um, bit, just to give you also an idea, we talked about culture and tradition. Culture and tradition are not only the reasons for forced marriage. There are other aspects as well. Um, as you can see in the family, fa um, in the slide, family is also one of the reasons for forced marriages. Um, you might be familiar, or you heard about the Robert Putnam. He is a politologue, and he um, 
says, I, I'm making an um, analogy from his bonding social capital theory. So if we refer to Putnam's distinctions between bonding social capital and breaching social capital. So as an individual, if you are in a bonding family system, it might be difficult to um, evolve and involve as an individual person. Um, but he suggested bridging, for example, it's much better because the opportunity or the possibility to go further, go ahead. Um, and if I use this analogy also for the family, it should be possible for the individuals within the family context to, go, to, to develop further, that should be possible. So the family should be much more bridging rather than bonding where the individual cannot survive. Um, so a family should not be a mafia kind of um, uh, construct, if I put it in a simple words like this. Um, and then there are also other reasons like adultism. A lot of the times um, adult persons think they know what the right for the children or they know what is the best for their future and then also um, marry them off. And um, discrimination, discrimination, that's also from the, um, for example, Western societies and gender or sexuality, community bonding. So we touch upon a few um, courses here already. Just fast facts, um, numbers from the Center of Competence Against Forced Marriages. Um, we heard a lot about women and girls being victims of harmful traditional um, practices. But um, from the Swiss experience, 90% of the men um, of counseling were ma male, um, so victims of forced marriage. So it's not few. Um, and also, not all of them leave the family, um, but 20% or 1% leave their family. So for us, as a legal, um, as, a, as a human rights, um, legal scholars or students, it's very interesting to know the criminal proceedings of very few, especially in the um, crimes where the family is involved. So in Switzerland, um, since 2013, um, forcing someone to marry against their will, it's a crime. So as you can read or see in the slide, um, the custodial sentence not exceeding five years. So it's not some small crime, it's, it's, um, it's up to five years um, prison sentence. But if we look their um, verdicts or decisions, court decision based on this article 181A, there are very few. So the one actually which was covered by the media um, happened this July 2020, actually due to the COVID, they postponed the procedure. It was happened, it was, it should be happened in May this year, but because of the lockdown situation, um, it was in 1st of July. So there was this case of a um, father from um, Turkish background who had this procedure about his two daughters forcing into marriage. And this Appellationsgericht, that's called of appeal, because in 2017, the first instance said the father is um, um, guilty of forced, of tried forced marriage. And then he went further, did the appeal and the court of appeal in one region in Basel, they approved and said the father is guilty of forced marriage. So there are really one or two cases um, where the jurisdiction or where the court decisions are based on this special norm 181A in the Swiss Penal Code. Um, and then now specifically also coming and to end also this um, talk and presentation on harmful traditional practices, especially on forced marriage. Um, this is one media coverage um, where it was actually, and also the experience um, from the um, Swiss Competence Center against forced marriage that um, they were expecting much fewer cases, especially during the month of May and June. Um, but the, on the contrary, um, I mentioned already the transnational aspect to forced marriage, right? The people are brought to their home countries or different countries and um, 
and then married against their will there. This didn't happen, but it was just postponed. So um, the new technology was used. There were marriages happening through Skype, WhatsApp video calls, um, marriages, I mean, forced marriages. So this is one of the experience or um, observation that was um, concluded also in Switzerland. When we talk about domestic violence, there, were, there are studies which says that domestic, there is no increase in domestic violence, but on this particular forced marriage, there are much more cases where this, um, this planning for this forced marriage happened a lot. And um, also because a lot of parents didn't go to their work due to this corona half lockdown, they stayed at home and the pressure at home was increasing. And they also, for example, conducted the helpline of this um, competence center against forced marriage. So I think I would stop here and um, free to be for the discussion, questions, remarks, and we also have enough time to um, go through the topics that uh, that we um, that we heard today, and also um, yeah to discuss about it.